Hey, I am super glad that you're here. If you're visiting with us, I just want to quickly tell you where we've been and where we're going. We've been studying the book of Hebrews in a sermon series that I've called Seeing Jesus as Jesus Is. And that's really important, not only for our culture, but for the culture in which uh, the book of Hebrews was written. There were these Jews who had converted to Christianity, who had decided that they were going to follow Jesus. But because of persecution, because of other things that were happening in the, in the world, they were like, I'm not so sure Jesus is who he says he is. And so they needed to be reminded that Jesus is exactly who he says he is. And... Uh, We're continuing on in this sermon series, and if you missed it last week, we studied from Hebrews chapter 3, um, all, verse 16, all the way from Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16, all the way to um, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, and it really gave us a warning, and the warning was this, don't stop following God or else. Now, when you were a kid, your parents used to give you warnings, but it was also followed up with a threat, right? Well, what we find, this is a warning, but it's not followed with a threat. It's followed with a promise. It's followed with a declaration. And the declaration is simply this, that if we stop following God, we're not going to be able to enter into heaven. Now, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, let me just stop and, uh, and share with you this, because in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, and I think our PowerPoint's having some problems, so just kind of ignore that behind me. Follow along in your Bible, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. Um, let me just read uh, this for you so it kind of summarizes what, where it is we're talking about, because that was kind of like a summarizing statement to talk about how important it is for you to follow God. Hebrews 4.11 says, Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. What's the rest that God is talking about here in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 11? Well, if you remember... The Hebrews author had been talking about the book of Numbers and how these Israelites had been faithfully trying to follow God. And, uh, and he told them, he said, I've got a land that I want to give to you. It's flowing with milk. It's flowing with honey. It's a wonderful paradise. And they called that the promised land, which was also called their rest. And the reason that the promised land was described as being their rest was because they had spent 400 years in captivity being beaten on, being forced to work. They were worn out. They were tired. They were fatigued. And God said, I'm going to give you some rest where the only person you have to serve is me. Where the only thing that you have to concern yourself is how to please me. And so this was called their rest. And what the Hebrews author is doing is he's comparing the rest that, that, that these Israelites had. Because if you remember this, they got to the edge of the promised land. They were almost there. They were almost able to enter into it. But they didn't enter into it. You know why? Because as they were uh, on the edge of this promised land, they were, they were scouting out the land to make sure that it was everything that God had told them it would be. And they had a report come back to them that, hey, I don't know that this land is everything that it's cracked up to be because there's some pretty uh, powerful people living there. And I'm not sure we can do it. And so the people flat out refused to follow God into the promised land because they didn't trust him. Because they didn't believe he said was who he said he was. And so the Hebrews author is like, hey, the Israelites, these Jewish people, a whole generation of them missed out on the promised land because of their failure to be diligent to follow him. You and I, we have a rest that's been promised to us and it's not on this earth. The, the, pro- the rest that you and I have been promised is in heaven. And that's an eternal rest. And so the Hebrews author in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 11 is like, you guys, you and me, we need to be diligent to follow Jesus so that we will enter that rest. And it's so much greater and so much better than a land that is flowing with milk and honey. So the warning is given to you and I in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 11. Be diligent to enter that rest. Do everything within your power to make sure that you are going to be in heaven. Okay? That's what it's saying there in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 11. And maybe you're like, but Mark, it's so hard to follow God. I don't know if I can do it on my own. Well, here's the good news. And this is where we continue on today, this morning in Hebrews chapter 4 starting in verse 12. You don't have to be diligent on your own. You have help. 
to assist you in being diligent to enter that rest. In fact, the title of this morning's sermon is, Help is Here. And I hope this morning's sermon will be an encouragement to you as we talk about the rest of heaven, our eternal rest where we get to spend eternity with God. That we don't have to, it's tiring, it's, 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 it's wearisome to try to enter this rest on our own. Anybody else tired? Anybody else worn out a little bit? Could you use some rest? You want to get there? Me too. And the good news is that God offers some help to assist us to make sure we get there. Let's read our text, and then we're going to study our text. Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need." In those five verses that we just got done reading here this morning, there are three tools that God gives you to assist you to endure. Enduring is hard. Being faithful to God is hard. Being obedient to God is hard. How do I know? Because if it was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? And so maybe this morning you need some uh, help to be faithful. You need some help, some encouragement uh, to be diligent in your faith. Here's three tools God gives to us. The first is his word. His word. Whose word? God's word. The word of God. The Bible is what we're talking about. God has gifted it to us. Look at verse 12 as to what it says. It says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Two descriptions they are given in verse 12 to talk about God's word and the first is this, God's word is powerful. It's powerful. And there's two adjectives that describe the power of God's word and the first word that's used to describe there is to say that God's word is alive. Did you catch it? It's living. What do we mean exactly when we say that God's word is alive? What do we say when we say God's word is living? The living word. Well, we mean it's not stale. We mean it's not stagnant. We mean it's not stiff. Now, what we don't mean is that it changes. God's word doesn't change. But what does change is is the way that I apply it to my life. And I can read a a passage of scripture that I read, you know, five years ago, and I got some truth that I applied to my life back then, but now I'm I'm a different person than I was five years ago. And what's amazing is that as I read that same scripture that I read five years ago, I'm finding that there's some things that are different in me. And God's word still applies. God's word is still practical. That's how God's word is made alive. It's not a calculus textbook. Are we amen? We glad for that? It's not a calculus textbook. It's not a Tom Clancy novel. You know, you can read a Tom Clancy novel and if someone said, hey, you want to read this? I know I've already read that. I've already read that. I don't need it. It's not a Tom Clancy. It's alive. It's fresh. And because it's alive and because it's afresh, that makes it powerful. You see that? The second adjective used to describe God's word is not that it's only, uh, is, it, is it alive, but it's active. Hey, what's the opposite of active? The opposite of active is passive, right? God's word is not passive when it comes to controversial topics. The Bible is not silent when it comes to modern day hot button issues. It promotes God's truth on such matters as abortion, same sex marriage, 
transgender issues, alcoholism, women's roles in the church, church mission. The list goes on and on. You find a hot button topic, God has spoken to it. And that's because God's word is active. It's not just sitting back and being like, well, we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to talk about that. It's active. It's out there and promoting God's truth. Here's my question. How can a book that was written so long ago, portions of it, 4,000 years old, how can a book that was written so long ago be practical on issues that you and I are facing today? The reason? It's active. It's powerful. And the fact that the Bible is practical and applicable for all areas of your life it tells me a lot about who the author of the book is, doesn't it? Because the author of the book of the Bible is ultimately who? It's God. And uh, if this Bible is practical and applicable, it's because it's written by a God who is all-knowing and who is timeless and who is truth. And truth never changes. If it was true 4,000 years ago, it's true today. And it's written by a God who is truth. And he wrote a book that is all-knowing and is timeless. That's power. God's word is powerful. Secondly, God's word is penetrating. Did you see what it says there in the middle of verse 12? It says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow. We live in a very, uh, uh, we live in a farming community, a lot of farmers in our church, and, and you understand this, that before a farmer can reap a harvest, what has to happen to the soil? The soil has to be tilled. It has to have some seeds put into it. Before a surgeon can remove a tumor, what does he have to do? He has to make a cut before he can remove uh, the tumor. He has to make a cut with a scalpel. And it's God's word that tills the soil of our heart so that we can have a harvest. Um, and what God's word is declaring here in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 is that God's word pierces us deep as far as the division of the soul and the spirit and joints and marrow. It gets to the heart of the issue. You see, God's word is not just simply a, some sort of surfacey adjustment. Okay? It gets to the root of the issue. It's not some fluffy, feel-good nonsense that fades away like my hairline did, right? It endures. It's not going anywhere. And it penetrates deep to the heart of the issue. It's penetrating. Um, you may or may not even care or even know, but I was having a hard week this last week. Just kind of really feeling tired, and I get this way from time to time. Feeling fatigued, feeling burdened, feeling just kind of stressed out a little bit. And we've got such wonderful elders, and I, was just, I just shot them an email and just said, guys, this has been a rough week, and just not pray for the sermon, just ask that. And each one of them just responded in just the way that you would expect your elders to respond. They responded with Scripture. They responded with God's truth that doesn't change. Even though my feelings are all over the map and they're up and down, they just responded with a truth that penetrates to the core to remind me of what is up, right? And I appreciate that so much. God's word is your tool for transforming your life. You want some change to happen in your life? How am I going to change? Forget Joel Osteen's five methods of self-help, okay? The way that you're going to change is by hearing God's word. And let me just share with you a little bit about what God's word has to say about how it's going to transform your life. And it does it through penetration. It does it through getting to the heart of the matter. First of all, God's word penetrates my immaturity. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 2 it says like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk of God's word that by it you may grow up to salvation. You see it's God's word that matures me. It's God's word that grows me. It's God's word that shows me what he expects from me. And listen, I'm not there yet. Are you? But I'm working on it. And I'm striving towards it. And I'm making some improvements. Sometimes it seems slower than others. But God's word is what penetrates my immaturity. God's word also penetrates my uncertainty. 
It penetrates my perplexity when I'm faced with a situation and I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. God's word, we're told, is what shines the light on my decision. That's why Psalm 119, 105 says, God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It shows the direction that we're supposed to go. How many of you have been facing something in the last month where you just didn't know what decision to make? Where you were like, man, I, left, right? I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Here's what you need to do. Get into God's word. Put your nose in the book. It will penetrate your perplexity. It will show you what you are to do. How to handle matters in your life. It's God's answer to all of life's problems. And he's written it for us very plainly, very clearly. And if you don't know where to go to find the answer to what you're facing, I bet there's somebody in your life who does. Ask them, hey, do you know what God's word has to say about this situation? Because I'm struggling in this. Can you point me to a verse I bet you they can. God's word also penetrates the darkness of my human heart. James chapter 1 verse 23 and 24 says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he's looked at himself in the mirror and gone away, he's immediately forgotten what kind of person he is. You know what those verses are saying? It's saying that God's word is a mirror. What do you do with a mirror? You look in it, right? And you correct and you see the imperfections and then you're like, oh yeah, I need to, well yeah, I got to shave, got to brush. You, you see what's not right and you fix it. And God's word helps us understand who we really are. There's some misconceptions I may have about myself. I may think of myself as a better person than I really am. But when I read God's word, it shows me very clearly what kind of person I am. Going back to our text in Hebrews chapter 4, at the end of verse 12, you're going to see that it, this is reiterated, that God's word penetrates to the darkness of my human heart. Listen to what it says at the end of verse 12. It says, For the word of God is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. You see, nobody else may, you might be able to fool everybody else with your motives. You're not fooling God. He knows what is at the heart of your motive. And God's word penetrates to the darkness of my heart. And it convicts me. And it shows me when I have wrong ideas or wrong thinking in my mind. God's word is powerful. God's word is penetrating. Do you believe it? Now be careful. Because I'm going to ask you a very pointed question. Do you believe God's word is powerful and penetrating? Because if you answer yes... And here's my follow-up question. Why aren't you reading it? Why aren't we opening it up and absorbing it and applying it to my life? If I believe it's powerful, if I believe it's penetrating, if I believe it has the answers to fix my life's problems, why isn't my nose in it more? It's a pretty valid question. If we want to have the power and the penetrating uh, factors of, the, of God's word, we've got to put it in our life. And God has graciously given you the tool of his word to help you endure, to help you last, to help you get into your rest. It's the words that offer encouragement. It's the words that offer life. And be thankful for that. Here's the second tool that God has given you to help you endure in this life. It's his son. Look at verses 14 and 15 because, uh, in just a second here, in Christ, Jesus Christ is our example of how we're supposed to endure the difficulties we face in this life. And did you know that you're supposed to face, that you're going to face some difficulties in this life? John chapter 16 verse 33, Jesus just very plainly puts it, in this world you will have trouble. Anybody living out that truth? <laughs> in this world you will have trouble. Is that a news flash to anybody? The longer that I live, the more I become acutely aware that not only is life short, but life is hard. And it seems the older I become, the problems that I face in this life are larger and more serious. I mean, when I was a kid, um, see if you can relate to this, my biggest struggle when I was a kid would be that I was watching TV in the comfy chair, and when I got up to go get a snack from the kitchen and came back, I found my sister had taken my spot because I failed to say, place back. But that, you would have thought that was the end of the world, right? 
Well, now as a 44-year-old man, I'm telling you, my problems are just a little slightly more serious than not being able to sit in a comfy recliner to watch G.I. Joe in the afternoons, right? I mean, I've got people in my family who've been diagnosed with terrible diseases and who are dying. I've got insurmountable debt that just seems like, oh, I'm never going to get on top of this thing. I've got relationships that are broken and damaged and, and they seem like they're not going to be fixed. In this world, you will have trouble. But the part of that verse that I want to point out to you that matters more than how much trouble you are facing in this world is the last half of verse uh, uh, 33. And it's Jesus' words. He says, take heart. I have overcome the world. Isn't that good news? Doesn't that bring some hope? Jesus has overcome all the troubles in this world. He's our help. He's our comfort. He's our example. And in Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 and 15, we see this truth that Jesus has overcome the, the, all the world, all the troubles this world would throw at us, that he's overcome them. We see that truth reiterated. Look at verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Two ways that Jesus brings help. First of all, his example is one of, that is victorious. Jesus is victorious. Did you see it there at the, in verse 14? It uses this phrase to describe Jesus that's not used anywhere else. That he has passed through the heavens. That he came to this earth, he lived successfully as a man for 33 years, he died and was resurrected and rose back to heaven again. He came down and he passed back through the heavens. He crossed the finish line. He's done. He's victorious. And did you see how it describes him? He's, descri he's described as our great high priest. He's not like the priests of the Old Testament. How did the priests of the Old Testament deal with all everybody's problems? I mean, their one solution to everybody's problems was like, go get an animal and I'll kill it for you. That was their big solution. Oh, you got a problem? Bring a dove, bring a goat, bring a bull. We'll kill it. I'll sprinkle its blood. Problem solved. That was their only solution to all of the world's problems. But then the New Testament, Jesus shows up. And Jesus didn't offer an animal as payment for sins. He offered himself once and for all. And his solution for sin was so great that it only had to be done once. One and done. That's Jesus. And so the sin that you find yourself drowning in and entrapped in, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is saved. Jesus still saves. And Jesus will save you from your sins. He saved you from sins you don't even know you're going to commit yet. Have you thought about that? That ought to blow in your mind. If there is no more greater victory than that to be had, that Jesus has defeated sin. Everything that we will face, Jesus has faced it. He's faced temptation. He's faced death. He's faced fear. And Jesus went on ahead of us and he conquered it all. He's victorious. Here's the second way that Jesus helps us. And I think that you'll find great encouragement in this. I know I did. Jesus is sympathetic. He's sympathetic. Look at verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Verse 15 is an intentional double negative in the Greek text. And it's translated that way in the English. We don't speak in double negatives because it's confusing, right? For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. So if we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, what do we have? We do have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. So why does the Greek put it in that language? And why did the English translators leave it as a double negative? Here's why. For emphasis. 
to emphasize the truth that Jesus has been there, done that, he's experienced what you've experienced, and he, he can relate to that, and he has great sympathy for that. What does sympathy mean? Sympathy means to feel what others feel. Jesus feels what you feel. Jesus is touched with the pains and the hardships in this life. Jesus feels the weight of what you feel. He feels the weight of trial. He feels the weight of temptation. He feels the burden of life. Unless somehow you get the wrong thinking about Jesus that says, well, how can Jesus possibly feel what I feel? He's God. He's perfect. Everything's easy for him. That's why he came as a man. So that he could relate to how it how you feel when you're tempted. So that he can relate to how you feel when you're tired. So he can relate to, to how you feel when, man, you're just struggling and you're sad. And so let's dispense with the notion in order to feel the weight of temptation that somehow you have to fall and crumble under it. Think of it this way. Think of an Olympic weightlifter. Who feels the weight more? The guy who gets the weight halfway up and then drops it or the guy who picks the weight up, puts it up over his head, and gets the gold medal. Clearly the champion who successfully lifts the weight feels the weight more than the guy who got it halfway up and drops it. And don't let anybody fool you into thinking that Jesus doesn't understand or, or can't sympathize with what it is you're facing right here in this life because he's God. Don't forget, he came as a man for the sole reason to die on the cross for you, but also so that he could sympathize with what it is you're going through. That should bring some encouragement to you. Remember, it was Jesus the Christ who wept alongside of Mary and Martha at the tomb of their brother Lazarus. He feels what we feel. And if you've ever cried out to God over the hurts and over the struggles that you have in your life, you better believe that Jesus is weeping alongside of you. God has given us his word to help us endure. God has given us his son to help us endure. To be like, listen, been there, done that. Jesus has been there, done that. And he's in heaven and he endured. You can too. And finally, our text says that God gives us his throne. Let's finish off our text in verse 16. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. I want you just to think about it just for a moment. Think of all the ways that God could have chosen to describe his throne. He could have called it his throne of holiness. He could have called it his throne of glory. You know, this light that's just shining. He could have called it the throne that will drop you to your knees and cause you to put your face at the ground. He could have called it the throne of unapproachability, as Isaiah found it to be. But instead, here in Hebrews chapter 4, God calls it the throne of grace. Verse 16 is really interesting. It says, therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. What's that all about? Verse 16 is, an, is really a plea. It's an urging with you to pray. That approaching the throne of grace, that's the Holy Spirit's way of saying, hey, listen, are you stressed out? Are you worried? Are you anxious? Take your concerns, your worries, your cares, and bring them to the, God's throne. Come before your king with your requests. Come before your king with your problems. Come before your king with your concerns. What a beautiful thing that is. Maybe when you're sitting together around the uh, dinner table, before the meal is consumed, the question is asked, who wants to say grace? What are they asking? What's the question that's being asked? Who wants to pray? Who wants to approach God's throne of grace? That's what they're asking. It comes from this idea that God's throne is a throne of grace. From Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. And when you and I pray to God, we are drawing near to his throne. 
And through our prayers, when we bring our requests to God with confidence, there's two ways that God answers your requests. Did you know that? Two ways that God answers your requests when we draw near with confidence to God's throne through prayer. The first is God answers with mercy. What's mercy? Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. I'm going to ask you a question and it's not rhetorical. I want you to answer it. What do we deserve? What do we deserve? Death, right? Romans 3, uh, 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. That's what you deserve. That's what I deserve. Death, punishment, nothing good. So the pain that we're asking God to remove from our life, when he chooses to do that, guess what he's giving to us? Mercy. Every healing, every safety in your travels, every relief from pain that you experience in life, emotional, physical, and spiritual, every test or exam that you pass, those are mercies that have been extended to you from God's throne. God giving mercy, not giving us what we deserve because we deserve death. That's what we deserve. And anything other than death is a mercy from God. Second thing, that when God doesn't give us mercy, did you notice what he does give us? He gives us grace. See, sometimes God allows us to experience difficult things in our life and he doesn't give us the mercy that we seek. And in those situations, what is it that God gives to us? His grace. Similarly to what Paul said when he had the thorn in the flesh and he says, I prayed three times that God would extend mercy to me and remove the pain from my life. Did God do it? No. But what did God answer and give him instead? He said, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm giving you my grace. If what we deserve is death, then there's not a whole lot of good things on the list of what we do not deserve. I recently heard of a college professor who was giving his Bible college students a final exam and this uh, professor is notoriously difficult. And uh, this exam was different than all the other tests that he'd ever given. He said, the entire course is on the line. If you get an A on this exam, you'll get an A in the class. If you fail this exam, you will fail the class. No notes. You will not be able to use any notes. You'll not be able to use any other tools. And so the students came into the classroom. After studying all night, they crammed. They, uh, they studied very diligently. And they came into the classroom and they saw the test was face down on everybody's desk where they were sitting. And in the upper right hand corner was written their name. And the professor gave the instructions, you may now flip the test over and begin to take the test. And as every student flipped over the test, they saw that every single answer, every single blank was filled in with the correct answer. And the professor simply said, thus ends the lesson on grace. What a powerful picture of getting what we, do, what we don't deserve. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God knows exactly what you need and he will give you exactly what you need. Maybe it's his mercy to stop the pain or maybe like Paul, his grace to help you endure through the pain. Whatever God's answer is to you, continue to bring your needs and concerns confidently to his glorious throne of grace where mercy and grace are realized. So do you see the tools that God has given us to help us endure, to help us finish this race well? He's given his word, powerful and penetrating. He's given us his son as our example that we should follow. And he's given us his throne of grace, which we can approach through prayer any time we need to or want to. And so as we conclude this morning's sermon, two journal questions for you to consider. How are you doing at enduring? How are you doing at finishing strong? You tired? Are you weak? Are you worn out? Got some heavy things that you're burdened with? Tempted to quit? 
The second question is this, in this moment, what do you need the most? Out of the three things that we've talked about, the three tools that God provides to us to use to help us endure, what is it that you need the most right here in this moment? Is it guidance through God's word to help you understand what direction you're supposed to take with a difficult situation? Maybe it's some encouragement. Life is hard. You're struggling. You don't know if you can go forward. And maybe you need some encouragement by looking to Jesus who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Or maybe you need to receive some grace and mercy through prayer. We're going to offer our time decision here in just a moment. And I want to pray for you first. And then we're going to have our time decision. Let's stand together and let's pray. And then we'll have our time decision.